South and North Korea have agreed to break ground in less than two weeks on a project to connect their railways and roads. It'll be an historic day, but the question is, will the sanctions on the North allow them to do it? South Korean President Moon Jae-in continues his tour of the country to promote economic growth in the different regions. The key to growth, he says, is going to be innovation, including so-called smart manufacturing. And in the third quarter, the profitability of electronics manufacturers helped lift overall profitability to its highest level in three years. It seems the profits, though, were concentrated in a few firms in particular. News Center begins now. It's 8 o'clock p.m. here in Korea. Thanks for joining us on News Center. I'm Devin Whiting. The two Koreas have agreed on a date to hold a groundbreaking ceremony for work to connect their railways and roads. And it'll happen before the end of the year, as agreed by the leaders of South and North in their summit back in September. Our Park Jun has the latest. South and North Korea have agreed to hold the groundbreaking ceremony for their joint project to modernize and connect their railways and roads on December 26. And it will take place at the North Panmun station within the border village of Kaesong. This comes after the two sides held working-level talks on Thursday at the Joint Liaison Office in Kaesong. And according to Seoul's Unification Ministry, it's been decided that around 100 people from each side will attend the ceremony. South and North Korea held talks today about the ceremony to start work on connecting railways and roads along the Gyeonggi Line and the Dongye Line. We agreed to hold the ceremony on Wednesday, December 26 at Panmun Station. The ceremony will mark the official start of the two Koreas' joint transportation projects. The leaders of the two Koreas agreed at their Pyongyang summit in September to break ground on interconnected railways and roads within the year. To make it happen, the two sides have been inspecting the North's railway since earlier this month. They also completed a joint survey of roads along the western side of the peninsula, but have yet to fix a schedule for inspecting the ones in the east. The ministry says the ceremony will show the two Korea's strong determination to push ahead with the project, but there's still the question of whether the ceremony would violate U.S.-led sanctions. If it would violate them, then Seoul will have to seek a sanctions waiver from Washington. The South Korean government will continue to work with the U.S. to go ahead with the event in a way that does not raise concerns from the international community. Park Kijun, Arirang News. There have been reports in recent weeks that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un would visit Russia before the end of the year. But the South Korean ambassador to Moscow now says it's not likely to happen by then. Ambassador Won Un Yun Gun met with reporters on Thursday and said the Russians had initially hoped to have Kim at the Kremlin sometime late this year for a meeting with President Putin. Moscow's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had invited Kim during his visit to Pyongyang in May. Though there could be many reasons for the delay, Wu said it's likely because Kim has a lot on his plate at the moment, including his planned visit to Seoul. And with several other diplomatic events lined up for the year, including the second North Korea-U.S. summit, the ambassador said it's hard to project when Kim will go to Moscow. Satellite pictures of North Korea reportedly show that the regime's nuclear test site at Pungeri has not been completely shut down, as was promised. The site appears to be active, at least partially, even after the tunnels used for testing were closed off back in May. Kan hyung reports. A U.S.-based North Korea monitoring website says buildings and roads remain intact at the regime's Pungeri nuclear test site, suggesting they could be reused if Pyongyang decides to do so. 38 North, a project of the Stimson Center think tank, said satellite images from late October and November showed the two biggest buildings at the command center are still in place, as well as some support facilities. About two dozen personnel were also spotted in the images of the site, with roads showing constant maintenance and vehicle tracks. The website explained that Pungeri may only have been mothballed with possible reactivation. South Korea's defense ministry declined to comment on 38 North's report, but said that it's aware of the situation and has been keeping a close eye on the matter. 
After his talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in October, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the regime was ready to allow inspectors to visit the Punggye-ri nuclear test site for verification of its complete dismantlement. But since then, no follow-up talks or steps have been reported. North Korea previously conducted all of its six nuclear weapons tests at Punggye-ri before closing it in front of a group of international journalists back in May. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. Some media reports have speculated that the reason President Moon Jae-in flew west, stopping in Europe on his way to Argentina last month for the G20 summit, was because the South Korean presidential plane is subject to U.S. sanctions and couldn't stop in America. The Blue House today rejected those reports as nonsense. A spokesperson said Thursday that the reason the president went via the Czech Republic is completely unrelated to the sanctions on North Korea, which ban any plane that's landed in the north from landing in the U.S. without clearance 180 days in advance. The Blue House said there were no discussions with the U.S. about the matter. Rather, the Czech Republic was chosen as a suitable refueling point for the plane, he said, and flying west was better in terms of biorhythm. In September, President Moon's plane did, of course, land in North Korea when he went to Pyongyang for his third inter-Korean summit. This week, South Korea is hosting one of the biggest events in table tennis, the World Tour Grand Finals. And competing in the mixed doubles are a South Korean man and a North Korean woman, the same pair who won a tournament together back in July. Won Jung Hwan reports. Table tennis's biggest stars are in South Korean city of Incheon, aiming for glory at the 2018 World Tour Grand Finals. The top 16 players in the men's and women's singles and the top eight teams in the men's, women's and mixed doubles, based on their performances in the 12 World Tour events, are competing in the four-day tournament which opened on Thursday. And among the table tennis superstars, the spotlight for this year's tournament is on the joint Korean team. Chang Woo-jin from South Korea and Cha Yoo-shim from North Korea have once again teamed up in the mixed doubles in front of South Korean spectators. Chang and Cha won the mixed doubles title at the Korea Open in Daejeon back in July. They also played together at the Austria Open last month, losing in the semifinals to a Chinese duo. The unified team faced 2017 world champions Maharu Yoshimura and Kasumi Ishikawa of Japan in their first match. But backed by the home crowd, they managed to earn a 3-2 victory. Ever humble, after the game, the United Korean teammates complimented each other for a wonderful start. I had some pressure during the game because we were facing the defending champions in the first match. As I was nervous, we dragged out the game for quite long. But I think we managed to win because my sister did so well. My little brother did well and that is why we grabbed a win today. With the win at the quarterfinal stage on Thursday, the joint Korean duo of Chang and Cha are one step closer for their dream of being crowned mixed double champions for their second time in their international careers. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News, Incheon. President Moon Jae-in was in the southeastern province of Gyeongsangnam-do today to talk about what Korea needs to do to revitalize its economy. The key, he said, is innovation in manufacturing. The visit was part of the president's tour of the country aimed at boosting local economies outside of the capital Seoul. Our Blue House correspondent Hwang Ojun has this report. <laughs> President Moon Jae-in was speaking at an event on Thursday where the government revealed its strategies for innovation, which include the implementation of smart manufacturing in the southeastern province of Gyeongsangnam-do. He admitted the Korean economy is losing steam because the manufacturing sector, the nation's traditional driving force, is facing serious competition from emerging countries. <laughs> Gyeongsangnam-do has adopted manufacturing innovation as its key growth strategy. 
President Moon also asserted the importance of expanding the so-called smart factory system, an initiative that provides automation solutions and intelligent upgrades for higher productivity in manufacturing facilities, especially for small and medium-sized companies. He called the smart factories the key to innovation. As a matter of fact, the government has allocated over 1 billion U.S. dollars next year to support so-called smart innovation for smaller enterprises. President Moon said the administration plans to boost the number of smart factories to 30,000 by the year 2022. He also pledged to designate two smart industrial complexes next year and increase that number to 10 by 2022 as well. And by introducing and expanding the smart factory system, President Moon also promised workers that industrial accidents will be reduced by 30 percent. Before returning to Seoul, President Moon Jae-in visited a production line at a local smart factory and also had lunch with local business leaders to encourage them. Hong Wo-jun, Arirang News. Profitability last quarter at South Korean manufacturers rose to its highest level since 2015, according to the nation's central bank. This was mainly due to strong exports of semiconductors. Our Ko Ryun-hee explains. Korean companies saw their profitability increase in the third quarter compared to last year on the back of strong exports in the machinery and electronics sectors. This is according to the Bank of Korea's quarterly report released on Thursday, which is based on a sample survey of more than 3,000 companies. These firms' operating profits to sales ratio or profitability came to 7.6 percent for the third quarter. This is higher than last year's Q3 record of 7.4 percent. Breaking down by sector, profitability in the manufacturing industry hit a record high of 9.7 percent. This was mainly thanks to strong global demand for Korean semiconductors. Exports of semiconductors surged by more than 40 percent on-year in the third quarter. The BOK said another factor was a rise in exports of OLED panels. In fact, shipments of OLED panels accounted for almost half of all display panel exports in Q3, which was a big jump from last year. However, a separate report from the Korea Economic Research Institute shows that without the performances of these top companies, the situation in the electronics sector is looking grim. When the institute measured operating profits at 47 electronics companies for the first three quarters of this year, it grew by more than 50 percent on-year. But when it excluded the profits of Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, the nation's biggest chip makers, operating profits fell by almost 50 percent during the same period. Experts blame factors both at home and abroad. Korean companies' technological competitiveness has not been improving. On top of that, Korea is closely followed by China. Also, I believe a rise in labor costs made companies less competitive. News. Meanwhile, it was a mixed bag for South Korea's auto industry last month as production and exports increased, but sales fell domestically. That's according to the latest trade ministry figures, which show car production jumped 2.2 percent on year in November to exceed 390,000 units. For the year, though, through November, the figure is down 4.4 percent to 3.67 million units in total. Exports went up 1.6 percent from the month before thanks to better sales in North America and Europe, but sales in Korea dropped slightly by four-tenths of a percent. Sales of foreign brands in Korea went up, but homegrown brands saw an on-year drop of 0.7 percent. And in one of the clearest indications yet of how South Korea has been affected by turbulence in global trade, new figures show the country's export and import prices fell sharply last month. Kim ji has the details. According to the Bank of Korea on Thursday, the country's import prices fell for the first time since August, mainly due to a drop in international crude oil prices. Import prices decreased by 4.6 percent on month, the steepest drop since January 2015. Dubai crude Korea's benchmark slumped more than 17 percent compared to the previous month to around 65 U.S. dollars a barrel in November. It affected prices of raw materials, which dropped by more than 9 percent compared to the previous month. 
Meanwhile, export prices fell for the first time since March. They dipped by more than 2 percent in November compared to the previous month, the steepest drop since April 2016. The appreciation of the local currency contributed to the drop in export prices. It was trading at an average of 1,128 won against the greenback, a 0.2 percent drop from a month earlier. Prices of coal and petrochemical products dropped by more than 2 percent on month, while agriculture, forestry and fisheries prices fell by 1 percent. In particular, the price of Korea's main export, DRAMs, dropped by 2 percent from the previous month, the fourth straight month of decline. According to market researcher DRAM Exchange, the average price of the modules fell for the first time in two years in Q4 to 30 U.S. dollars in November. Kim ji Arirang News. South Korea's newly appointed finance minister, Hong Nam-gi, visited the National Assembly on Thursday to discuss economic policy with the leaders of the political parties. Minister Hong met with the chair of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, Lee hye chan who asked Hong to draw on his past experience to revitalize the economy. The newly elected floor leader of the Liberty Korea Party, Na kyung won said she will help the minister to the fullest if he presents measures that will cushion the side effects of the government's income-led growth policies, like the higher minimum wage, which the opposition says are moving too fast. South Korea's Navy, Marine Corps and Coast Guard kicked off their regular two-day Dokdo defense drill on Thursday. A Navy official confirmed that eight vessels, including a 3,200-ton destroyer and five aircraft, were deployed in the drill. The Dokdo defense drill, which aims to defend Korea's easternmost islets, dates back to 1986 and has been held twice a year since 2003. The last drill took place in mid-June this year. Dokdo Island has belonged to Korea since ancient times and is under the legal and effective control of the South Korean government, but Japan continues to make false claims to it. And the number of people who've visited Dokdo this year has surpassed 220,000. That's the highest figure since 2013 when Dokdo got around 250,000 visitors. It's also about 7% higher than last year's total. The Dokdo management office says what helped bring in more visitors was the fact that ferries to the island ran on a regular schedule from March to October and that more people are interested in Dokdo. In total, more than 2 million people have visited Dokdo since 2005 when it opened to the public for the first time. The South Korean government's been trying to encourage its citizens to start families to tackle the increasingly low birth rate. One of the measures has been to give them more paternal leave, an effort that's apparently having results. Compared to a decade ago, far more men now are exercising their right to take time off to raise their kids. So in Young has the details. In recent years, the number of men taking leaves of absence from work to take care of their children has risen sharply. Statistics Korea said Thursday that in 2008, the proportion of male workers taking paternity leave was about 1.2 percent, but by last year, the figure has surged to 13.4 percent. The agency attributed the increase to more government incentives for men to take parental leave, such as the introduction of a month for dad. The policy grants 100 percent of regular wages for the first three months of parental leave, covering up to about $1,780 U.S. Dollars a month. The subsidy goes to either a mother or father who take time off work after their partner has done so. Because it is typically mothers who take maternity leave, the policy was introduced to get more men to take time off and get involved in child rearing. Next year, the subsidy will rise to $2,225. U.S. Dollars. Despite the growing use of parental leave, Korea still has a long way to go to help and encourage more workers to take time off for child care. According to the Ministry of Employment and Labor, at bigger companies with more than 300 employees, 93 percent of staff have benefited from parental leave. But at small companies with fewer than 10 workers, only 39.8 percent of them have exercised this right. Seo Eun-kyung, Arirang News. A lot of kids say when they grow up they want to be a fireman, an astronaut, maybe a painter. Those are some of the traditional answers we hear, but a survey suggests that the jobs kids dream of are changing. Hong Yu explains. Students' job preferences are changing and some traditional job categories are losing popularity. 
The Ministry of Education and Korea Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training have released the results of a survey which shows the job preferences of 27,000 students from elementary, middle and high schools. One of the new entrants on this year's top 10 most preferred jobs was YouTuber, which was one of the top five jobs chosen by elementary school students. Another new job on the list was beauty designer, which includes jobs like hair designer, makeup and nail artist, and tattooist. For the past five years, teacher was the number one dream job for students, but it is losing popularity this year. It is still the most wanted job among middle and high school students, but has fallen in popularity over the past 10 years. And for elementary students, teacher has lost a top spot to athlete, which was the most desired job for more than 9% of elementary school students. Based on this research, more than 90% of schools are developing career education plans and many schools have a separate department in charge of such plans. Parents are also demanding information sharing and training so they can give their child career guidance. Hong Yu, Arirang News. The South Korean animation industry saw great success this year overseas. Sales grew at international expos by more than a third. Now the South Korean government is also looking to support the industry. Yoon Jung-min reports. South Korea's animation industry is gaining popularity around the world and could be the next Korean wave. According to the Korea Creative Content Agency, local cartoon producers sold some 142 million U.S. dollars of products at world's top four animation expos this year, a 34 percent increase from the year before. One local animation studio that has gone global is Studio Gale. This year, the company signed a contract with a Singaporean company to co-produce the animation Tish Tash. Founded in 2008, Studio Gale boasts expertise in a range of 3D animations from slapstick comedy to action-adventure. It has also worked with another producer, Iconics, on children's favorites, Bororo, The Little Penguin, and Tayo. Korean animations for preschoolers such as Bororo and Tayo are very popular overseas. On the other hand, the U.S. animation industry is focused on family animations, including theatrical animation films. I believe the Korean animation industry also has great potential for family animation if we focus on them. Other local producers such as Hong Dang Mu and Most Tapes have also seen success in overseas markets this year. Korean animation designed for children is popular overseas. The moving pictures are very delicate and pleasing to watch, and Asian values contained in the movies appeal to foreign markets. As the content industry emerges as a promising future growth engine, the Korean government is also pushing for its development. At Thursday's ministerial meeting, Prime Minister Lee nak emphasized the importance of bolstering the content industry, including games, animation and music. He called on ministries and the public sector to work together to support the industry. With the government's support, the content industry is expected to build on its recent success. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. And now we turn to Michelle Park for the updates from the Weather Center. Michelle, it looks like we're in for more cold wave alerts tonight. What's the latest? Well, yes, following this morning, short but heavy snowfall fell in the country. Now, a cold front has hit the nation, dragging temperatures to negative territory. And cold wave alerts are expected to be issued starting 11 p.m. tonight in Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, and Gyeongsangbuk-do, and also Chungcheong-do provinces. Now, despite a clear sunny skies tomorrow, wind chill factor is going to make it feel a lot colder than the actual readings. Beijing also has cloudy skies with some slightly warmer daily highs, while Tokyo stays cozy over in double-digit readings as well. Now, temperatures will plunge tomorrow. Seoul will begin the day at minus 8 degrees Celsius. Chuncheon drops down to minus 11 degrees, while Taegu and Gyeongju drops down to minus 5 degrees. Now, during the day, highs will still rise above zero in most parts, except over in Seoul, where it's going to be top, being a dozen go past the zero degree mark. And the cold conditions will continue until Saturday, and temperatures will start to pull up on Sunday under a mix of rain and snow nationwide. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
And that's where we'll have to wrap up this edition of News Center. Thanks for being with us. More live news from Arirang will be coming your way early Friday morning. Bye for now.